Of all the failed MMOs over the early 2010s, one game's failure hurt the most. With the promised potential of an engrossing sandbox open world, massive world PvP, and a truly player-driven economy like never before, this is Arcage, an MMORPG that captured the attention of players all over the world. For Origins, Arcage was born from the vision of Exile Games' Jake Song, creator of the incredible MMO lineage, which is still loved to this day, and then published in North America and Europe by Tryon Worlds, creator of Rift and Trove. It sought to redefine the MMO landscape with an array of ambitious features, but the game seemingly died after only a couple months. Throughout this video, I'll be reminiscing on the rise of this game and lamenting its fall, exploring the factors that led to it and the legacy it's left behind. So, this is the untold story of Arcage, a tale of ambition, promise, and greed. Together, we'll journey through the humble beginnings of a new player all the way to the end game, discovering what made this MMO so beloved, the future it holds, and to find that moment where that driving ambition clashed with the harsh realities of the gaming industry, but mostly greed. But did it really die? The game was never flawed at its core. The publisher of Arcage in the West, Tryon Worlds, had a history of mismanagement and monetized the game so heavily outside of what the core game felt like in the alpha tests that it didn't really resemble the game players had come to love, and many players left through mishandling of key events like Aurora. The fortunate thing is many of these issues were not the fault of the game, so the game has lived on through different avenues of playing like private servers and fresh starts. At the time of this video, Arcage Classic is a few months old and still thriving. This is a private server set on what many consider the golden era of Arcage, up to version 3.0, and is managed by other lovers of the game. I'll be talking more about the server at the end of the video, but in the meantime, you should give it a try if the game looks interesting to you, or you are an old player yearning for the game done right. Arcage is a very difficult game to describe quickly. It has ambition, creativity, and is even cited as the driving inspiration of one of the most anticipating upcoming MMOs, Ashes of Creation. What made Arcage unique from other MMOs of its kind, and what keeps so many players playing it after 10 years on private servers? If the game was so beloved, why does it look like this on Steam? Well, before anything, let's just look at how the game plays. The journey of a new player in Arcage starts not unlike many other MMOs, though I would say it's more exciting early on, as you aren't always waiting for the level cap to experience most of the game's features. You'll start by choosing one of two factions, either Nuia or Haranya, Western and Eastern continents respectively. Each faction consists of three different races with unique racial abilities and starting zones, but I wouldn't really worry about these too much. You'll then choose your skill set, which is initially slightly restricted, maybe just for first impressions of the game. But this choice is not permanent and it can be changed very easily early on. Then, as you level and fairly early on, you'll add two more skill sets, creating your actual class by combining three of the 10 skill sets. Initially, the game had 120 combinations, all with a uniquely named class per combination, like my personal favorite, Blade Dancer, which is Battle Rage, Songcraft, and Shadowplay. Of course, not all combinations are going to be considered viable with 120, but there's nothing wrong with playing something that's just fun to you. And you can always switch between skill sets if you need to, to be meta for an event, so experiment away and carve out something that just resonates with you, even if it's wonky. So after character creation, you'll find yourself in the starting zone of your chosen faction, and here you'll just learn basic game mechanics such as movement, combat, interacting with NPCs, doing a lot of quests, it's just a very run-of-the-mill MMO start. At least for the majority of the game's life, there's only been ground mounts in Arcage. They can level up independently, gain abilities like attacks and speed boosts, and some even have things like stealth. And they can be given their own armor, which you can upgrade. Getting your mount was a little underwhelming, considering how it was talked about. They said it'd be this personal bond between you and your mount, you'd grow it from a baby and all this. But it takes about 5 minutes and you just click F over and over to feed it, give it water, and play with it and all that. And then it's just fully grown and that's that. 
There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but I just remember players really hyping this up on release, like it was something special. There are no flying mounts in Arcade, but there are gliders. And this is something I absolutely love about the game. Gliders can glide. They can't really go wherever they want, but the feeling of running up a cliff to glide off it to get somewhere never really gets old somehow after 10 years. That limitation keeps the world feeling more alive. Everywhere in the game can be reached just about, and there are almost no invisible walls, so if you see a mountain, you can climb that mountain to quote somebody. And reaching those peaks just feels that more rewarding. Without flying mounts, the open world just feels much more alive, honestly. Think of many of the early complaints in WoW when flying mounts were introduced. The game felt more lifeless as you wouldn't really see players just going from point A to point B. They also just wouldn't work in a game like this because that kind of surveillance from the skies would just be too powerful in a game with so many trade caravans and world events and whatnot. And something I really love about gliders is the unique nature of so many of them. It's not just a one size fits all. You can get a sloth glider that can barrel up and do all these crazy flips, and you can get astro wings, which are my personal favorite, which let you almost float and control your vertical height better. They don't go as fast though forward. You can get a glider that can stealth, you can get gliders with dive bomb attacks, and they all have these different strengths and weaknesses in their turning ability, flight speed, acceleration, and so forth. And you can even enhance them further. Gliders are something I'm extremely fond of in Arcage. The game uses a simple tab targeting system for combat, and one of the best aspects of it to me is the combo systems. And what I mean by that is that many skills can interact with each other in different ways. And while there are too many to list here, some are baked into the skills, while others are effects that can trigger different effects from other skills. Examples could be drop back, a shadow play move that has you backflip backwards. While a great utility move, it also causes some abilities to no longer have a cast time for a couple seconds, or increase the range of others like um, throw a dagger, making this a really cool way to combat powerful moves if you can time it with the utility. I use it in the example here to instantly cast Thunder Earth. Other effects, and the more common ones you'll see, are from effects. Many skills may trigger different statuses on enemies, like shaking an enemy. When you combo this with other abilities, they may cause the enemy to be tripped, part of a wombo combo, if you will, where they fall to the ground and are essentially fully stunned for a short moment. So you'll be doing a lot of these basic quests for a while. They're very plain. One of the early things you may notice, and it's important to get this out of the way early, is a meter for labor on your UI. These are points that regenerate slowly that are used to do basic activities like crafting, harvesting, mining, or even opening loot from enemies. They may seem like a mobile-like mechanic, and many players are critical of it for this reason, including myself. But as I've played the game, I've started to understand how important a mechanic like this can be when done properly. To just keep the economy steady and keep viable gold-making methods for players of different skill levels and different time constraints. A more time-invested player may use all these labor points over the course of various activities like running packs to find the greatest gold to labor ratio. While a player who didn't have as much time or availability or just a little lazier, could do something very simple but not as profitable like process logs into lumber for example. And because so many activities cost labor, crafting is almost always profitable. In many other games like RuneScape for example, people train skills to get to 99, not to make money. And it's usually more profitable to just sell raw materials than to spend the time to craft it yourself like an uncut diamond. Because it's not the product they're after in RuneScape, it's the XP. But in Arcage, it's definitely the gold they're after, so in this sense, labor is really good. It time gates production skills and makes players decide what to invest their labor points into and what to buy outright from other players who made different decisions. If no one wants to use their points on processing logs to lumber, then lumber is going to become more expensive, making it something worth using those points on. So I feel it's just a very equalizing system in that sense and really does help keep that strong player-driven economy, in my opinion at least. Proficiencies are the game's non-combat skills, and there are plenty of these. They'll generally fit into two categories, gathering and processing with a few outliers. You level these skills by using labor towards them, and it gives you experience at a 1 to 1 ratio of labor used. So doing an action that costs 500 labor will give you 500 proficiency. You level through tiers and brackets, and as you hit certain milestones, not only will you unlock more valuable crafts, you'll also get a reduction on the labor required to do these actions, but that will also lower the proficiency gain you get as well since you're using less labor. 
and you can do these actions faster. The maximum proficiency is 230,000. The way you level these can be a little convoluted at first glance, but to simplify it, you can specialize in a handful of skills. And with a special item, you can increase that number even further and indefinitely. But as you get more specialized, the amount of skills you can upgrade past certain brackets will narrow more and more. There are a lot of unique proficiencies, and some of them have more utility than others. While you might not find a lot of unique craftable benefits from the commerce skill, if you're running a lot of trade packs, the decreased labor cost alone and action time can add up and be more than worth it, because it increases your gold to labor ratio so much. There's some more interesting ones too. Artistry is a skill that lets you write music using a sort of in-house MIDI composing system, and you'll be able to play music on many of the instruments in the game and craft playable instruments. Other players can hear the tunes you play also, for better or for worse. The crafting system can look deceptively simple, and in many senses, it is. So to get the gear, you get the materials and craft it, and then you upgrade that piece and so forth. There are three categories of gear most players will use. Crafted, like Illustrious to Ionad, which can be traded freely at any point. Obsidian, which is also crafted, but in a pretty different method, and untradeable once equipped or gear from world bosses and dungeons. Most players have their eyes set on the former, Illustrious to Ionad. To craft these, you'll first need to get yourself an Illustrious version of the craft. So let's pretend we're trying to make an Ionad sword. First, we craft Illustrious, which is just basic materials, kind of just a time sink. But when you craft this, it'll be a sealed Illustrious sword. And when you unseal this, it'll open as one of four variants at equal chances, giving different stat priorities. To upgrade to the next tier, Magnificent though, you need it to be a Summer variant. And this changes for every kind of weapon and gear, it'll always be a different variant, it's not always just Summer, but for swords it is. So you only have a 25% chance of the sword being Summer, meaning a 25% chance to upgrade it further. And this will continue again, so if you do get Summer, you can upgrade it to a Magnificent sword. And when you unseal your Magnificent sword, if it's that 25% chance again of being a Magnificent Summer Sword, you can upgrade it to Ethereum. And now's when it gets harder, because now there aren't four variants, there's seven. So when you craft your Ethereum, you only have a one in seven chance, or around 14% chance of it being upgradable. And the same repeats at Delphinad. And once you get an upgradable De Delphinad Summer Sword, you'll need an exorbitant amount of gold and materials to craft it into the ultimate weapon, an Ionad Sword but it could still unseal as a variant that gives poor stats, like for a sword to give you intelligence or something more set for a mage after all that investment. So let's say you did get it though. You got this amazing Delphinad sword. You got a 25% chance, 25% chance, 14% chance, 14% chance. Very rare to get that. And then you upgraded it all the way to Ionad, but it's still weak. It's a powerful base item, but it's not upgraded at all. So in comes the regrading system. To upgrade the gear, you regrade it. If you ignore basic gray items, there are 10 grades from Grand to Mythic, and you use scrolls from the printing skill to give yourself a percent based chance of upgrading it or failing. And if you want better odds, then regrade charms, which in Tryon servers were on the cash shop, but have found in game crafted variants on private servers. You start with something of a 40% chance to upgrade it, and as you get to the top, this will get down to as low as a 2.5% chance of success. The thing is, for mini tiers, if you don't upgrade it, it just fails and you waste your money. Bummer. But starting at the rank Celestial, you'll first only have a 10% chance of success, but then it no longer just fails. It'll have a 45% chance to just degrade all the way down to Arcane. And now there's still another 45% that's not accounted for. So if you roll that, the item breaks entirely. So that Ionad sword you have is just gone. <laughs> And after Celestial, there's no more failing at all. It's either you succeed or break the item entirely, and these chances of success just get wildly, wildly smaller. And this was more punishing early on in the game as well. At launch in earlier patches, the items could degrade even starting at Heroic, I remember. But here's an Arcage Classic regrade simulator. And I'm just gonna go right through it to see how long it takes to get an Epic. I'm not going to use any lucky sun points or regrade charms just because it would take too long to constantly click off them and click them back in for every time because realistically most players will only use them starting at unique about so 
We're just gonna do it raw and see how it turns out. The chance of even getting divine, pretty rare. So to get an epic is still honestly insane. And I think people think it happens more often because when it does happen, it pops up on the screen for everyone to see and makes you feel like, wow, maybe I could do this too. But it's just so extremely rare. But once you hit level 30, you'll get a Blue Salt Brotherhood quest that will reward you with your first piece of land. It's a tiny scarecrow garden. It's 8x8 eight eight in size. Most homes and farms are 16x16 16 16 to 24x24, 24 24, but they go much larger. And as you go further along, you begin a quest for a 16x16 16 16 size farm at level 50-ish about. And all throughout the leveling process, you've been getting these currencies called Gilda, mostly through story quests, but later through dailies and other methods which can be used for other designs, like houses or boats. And I really like that you get this currency early on, because it kind of makes you feel like you're able to participate in the world. It doesn't take much Gilda to get your basic house, a 16 by 16 house, only 15 or so, and you'll get about 70 or so just from doing the main story quest. So I think that's wonderful that you're able to just engage in the game like that, starting so low. And I think many other MMOs just lack in that department where you don't really get to do anything meaningful until you hit the level cap. Arcage has housing zones throughout the world, which are uninstanced and highly competitive spaces for placing land. And while there is a lot of land to go around, if it's available, players will usually try to capitalize on it. You can have your land in most all the regions of the game in several areas, and they don't really feel separated from the game world either. They fit in fairly naturally. You'll be walking along a road and see a house up on the hill, and it just it looks like it fits, and I really like that. The most competitive land will be near places by the open sea for trade routes on islands near competitive events like the Kraken world boss because there aren't nearby teleports to that, and you can teleport to your home, and a few other similarly strategic spots. Partly through creating this video, I actually upgraded my humble 16x16 cottage into a 28x28 chalet. I bought the Gilda design from my friend and then got to work on building it. It takes a lot of materials in the form of these condensed packs of lumber, stone, iron, and you manually build it one pack at a time. And this house took 85 packs. Luckily, I had some wonderful friends from my guild available to help with the process, as it can be pretty labor intensive as well but we got it built. And then onto decorating, you can put so many useful items in your home, like crafting benches, a mailbox, items that raise proficiencies when they're in your home, and even storage chests, a few of which you can set custom permissions to so that you can share some of your inventory with your family or guild or even public if you wanted to create a kind of, you know, those kind of like gift exchange things for like books and stuff that you sometimes see. Of course, it'd be in an honor system, which is a hard sell for most players. I love this because it makes my home feel more like a base of operations than a simple role-playing thing. I can farm here, I can craft here, and I can manage a lot of my items here. And with the large majority of players having the same in different regions of the game, it's part of what makes the game world feel believable. Not everyone is just sitting in their faction capital doing things, but they're also not in instance housing zones and separated from the game world. You'll run past these homes all the time. And I'm an awful decorator, but I'm working on it. One thing I love is that you can build partitions, some more traditional and some that look like actual walls. They're expensive, but this allows me to segment areas of the building into looking like rooms. Or this, which is like my little doorway where you might take your shoes off. I've only worked on this for a bit though, so the potential's a lot greater. 
And even cooler in mini homes is that you can remodel them. The tiny cottages usually can just be remodeled to different variants like the Nguyen homes, which have more color and variety. But you can also actually upgrade them, like in these specialized homes, which will even add an extra floor. I love that you can preview these as well because it's not a light decision to make for most. The cost is really high, but it's another thing to work on and look forward to. When you own land, you'll pay taxes on it weekly in the form of tax certificates. This starts fairly small, but it'll go pretty fast if you get a lot of land to prevent hoarding. You can buy tax certificates on the auction house from other players who are proficient enough in the construction kill to craft tradable ones through loyalty points, though this isn't very efficient, or by using your own labor to craft them at any built farm. It doesn't even have to be your own. It's not very efficient for your labor, but it is a method and I appreciate that. So with your land, you can do a lot of things with it. Homes, you can decorate and put all sorts of items in it that can have varying utility or crafting potential. But on your farms, you can put some decoration like fences and stuff, but most of their use will be for planting crops or raising livestock. You can also do other things like put trade packs on it to stage them for later use, though we'll get into that later. But regardless, the best thing about farms is that you can grow a lot of the materials that you won't get anywhere else in the game, like even simple things like potatoes. Most of those are only farmed by players and grown. So in order to get a lot of the materials for trade packs later on in some crafting recipes or potions, you'll need to either own land or buy crops from someone else who owns land. There are open world plants available sometimes like you'll see a potato out in the wild or something like that but it's they're not often and the yield is so small that it's really not worth considering viable but it's an option typically around housing areas you'll find seed and sapling merchants which sell just that for very cheap you can plant things almost anywhere in the world but if it's outside of your own land they'll be considered unprotected or illegal as some players call it because you're not paying taxes on them and other players can interact with them as well, meaning they could chop or harvest them or just uproot them entirely. But you can also, of course, plant them on your own land and it'll be protected. You can change the permissions of your farm to allow your guild or family to use your farm as well, or even public if you're that benevolent. It costs labor to place them in the open world and none to place them on your own land, but you'll still see people trying to grow massive farms in hidden areas of the game, hoping no one else finds them. This is especially common in the early stages of the game when not many players have land and it's always fun looking for these. The farming systems are pretty deep and enjoyable. You can water plants to make them grow quicker and plant crops suitable for the environment your land is in. You'll find upgrade paths to make things a little more convenient also as time goes on. It's pretty cozy just hanging out at your property because it's uninstanced and you still feel like a participant in the game world by just being home. And while there's a lot of PvP and competition in this game, it's still really enjoyable to just play the game like a Farmville light. Actually, it's no doubt a lot deeper than Farmville. I never played it though. I also realized how gorgeous some of the music is. I didn't appreciate it quite as much at the time, but it has such a homey feel to it that definitely makes me nostalgic. Now, as you level up, you may want to join a guild. And in most games, guilds just serve as a name tag, a little community to talk in. Maybe a trophy for server firsts for like the more hardcore players, but in Arcage, it's almost where every guild kind of has its own importance. The politics within guilds runs pretty heavy. The community is very alive and competitive with each other. And because of the ability to player kill and the competitive nature of gold, every player's name gets remembered when they do something. So if you're in a guild, your actions will reflect on your guild and other guilds may become hostile on site to you because of the actions of another player. Players may no longer invite you to world events or they may just kill you outright when they see you. The feel of combat is very fast. I often don't play with audio on, but when I do, I realize how great some of the sound design actually is. Everything just feels so impactful and punchy, honestly. 
it makes the grinds actually a lot more bearable. And besides the Songcraft tunes, those get old really fast. But here's some audio of just typical combat while fighting typical mobs for coin purses and a short demonstration of the combat as well. Land can be pretty competitive in Arcage, but nothing tops the four castle locations in the northern continent of Auroria. These are zones a guild can claim by conquering their lodestone, and once they possess it, they can build castles in a system somewhat similar to homes, but in a more modular fashion, being able to build their castle to defend, to defend their lodestone from other guilds. The appeal of castles is a few things. They are a way to gain a rare thing called Lord's Coins, which can be used for a few things from crafting to costumes, but are widely sought after. On top of this, land in Auroria is special as it can be used for a few farm materials like Archeum, as well as Sun Points, Moon Points, and Star Points. And when you own a castle, housing areas open up all around the perimeter of your land that guild members can place land. And those tax rates can be adjusted by the guild as well. When you pay taxes on these in the normal system, gold is then sent comparatively to the guild leader, which could then be divided up between the guild or used towards gearing their players, or just straight to the guild master. On a set schedule, scrolls will go automatically onto the auction house that can be bid on to declare a siege against the guild who owns a castle. Whoever wins this auction can, at a set time, attempt to conquer the claimed castle. It starts with 70 attackers from the same guild and then 50 defenders, and after a set time, 20 more defenders are allowed to join as reinforcements. Players can even own siege tanks in the same fashion as a boat or wagon to assist them in their siege. To claim the castle, a single player must channel the lodestone at the core of the castle for five minutes completely uninterrupted. It's no easy feat, but it can be done with the right tactics. World bosses are also a coveted source of gear, and guilds will compete over them regularly, as the spawns are spread far apart and the gear is so worth it. So for example, Anthlon will drop some of the best mage gear, so if your guild can kill them consistently and keep those kills to themselves without competition, they can gear their members up very fast. The naval warfare has always been a big feature of Arcage, and it's certainly fun. But I feel like the opportunities for it are limited primarily to very rigid events like the Kraken or Abyssal Attack. The emptiness of an ocean is calming and fitting, much like you wouldn't expect to find an exciting new planet with life every few minutes in a space sim, but Arcage isn't a space sim. So it'd be nice to see more opportunities for fights to break out just a tad. Ships are pretty interesting in Arcage. You build it like a home on a dry dock that will last for a couple days before expiring, but it's not bad to make them at all, like material-wise. The designs are usually the most expensive part by far. And when you build it, you get a few ways to customize it, like different sails for general sailing speed, different turbo boosts, different figureheads, which will give buffs, and things like harpoons and cannons. Harpoons can be pretty funny in Arcage. You can fire one at an enemy ship or land and mountains and such. And if it sticks, you can then reel yourself into it or reel it into you, depending on which is heavier. The physics are what make it kind of funny at the expense of some expected function. You can see boats go absolutely soaring into the stratosphere by an odd harpoon and then catapulting down. It could no doubt be done strategically too, but it's a little too unpredictable for that. It would be funny to see someone hit the physics engine enough to send a galleon crashing through a fishing boat or something though, as there is contact damage. The cannons on the other hand are a lot more standard and are just used as primary method of attacking other boats or sea bosses. And with regrading, you can also regrade your ship components, but this method is a lot less punishing. It's a flat 10 gold cost to regrade instead of like the variable amount, which goes up like 100 gold. Um, plus the regrade scroll itself, which isn't very expensive. And they can still break starting at Celestial, but the rates are widely agreed to be about 50% all the way to Mythic, as opposed to as low as 2.5. So you'll actually see some Mythic sales and whatnot, though it's still not very common. Earlier on, I mentioned packs. They're a huge part of Arcage's economy and magic. Think of them like goods for a trade caravan. You craft them at specific areas of each region, some even at player-owned buildings, each region having its own recipes. When you're carrying a pack, you move slower and you can't ride your mount, use your glider, or teleport. When these are on the ground, outside of your protected land like your home, 
Other players can pick them up as free loot. This is a big thing to mention, as we'll get into soon. The goal is to transport these packs from one region to another to sell them to a trader. Let's say you craft some fabric in Hasla, it'll cost you about four to five gold in materials. If you manage to bring this pack that you created all the way to Solace Headlands, they'll buy those packs for around 22 gold each. So bringing just one of those is still a profit, but for the time it takes to do that, it's just not very efficient. So early on, you'll get a donkey, the only mount you can effectively use with a pack, but you can only carry the one on your back and you're still slower than a typical mount. So then you can build a farm cart, which has a slots to hold two more packs. So now you're not just going faster, but you're also holding three times as many packs. Now even further, you can upgrade that to a wagon, which can carry four, and then a hauler, which can carry six, all the way up to a freighter, which can carry eight extra packs. So now you have nine packs, if you count the one on your back, and it's costing you about 40 gold to make those packs, but you can turn them in for around 200 gold if you get there safely. Using most tools available, it's about a 30 minute trek, which can be pretty cozy, honestly. Just watch YouTube on another monitor or something. But if you want to move a lot of packs, it's going to be the Merchant Schooner. It's a ship that can hold 20 packs on top of one on your back. These are the most risky, as you'll be going through open waters, which are almost always very dangerous. And if you're going across the water, that also means you're likely going to the opposite continents, which aren't your own faction. But the reward here is huge which makes this a great community activity to get protection because not to mention you're moving 21 packs, but the reward even gets bigger as you go across the sea. You can sell these for different things than gold, like charcoal, a valuable crafting material only obtained this way, or gilda, which you get from dailies or leveling, which are the primary currency for housing designs, as well as the merchant schooner design. If none of these old timey vehicles really interest you, then Cars have less room for packs, they can only carry two in the back, one on your back, and then one other passenger can ride who can carry another one. So four packs all together, but you move so much faster that you can avoid a lot of danger. So ultimately it is still a goal for many players to do this. Now, the biggest reason these longer trade runs are so dangerous is because you're going through hostile territories. Other players can destroy your ship. It can be rebuilt with a cheap material, but it takes little time. And all your packs will drop down, which is an important aspect. They can be picked up then by other players who can start running off with them, maybe loading them up into their own boats or carts. This is a huge part of the game's PvP, as it's all risk reward, running these simple trade runs and dealing with piracy and danger from anybody, pirates, your enemy faction and your own faction. So a less risky player may stick to their own continent. That's still a lot of gold. But the thing is here in many zones, there's a peace and war cycle. And when they're not in peace, they're either in a state of tension or they're in full out war, which means you can flag the PVP against even your own faction. This is called bloodlusting in the game or PKing or purpling as your character will go from green to purple as you initiate it. So in zones like Hasla, Paranor Ruins, and Windscour Savannah, part of the trek, as well as Unisteer and Rookborn Basin, these zones can be dangerous to move packs from, as players from your own faction might consider it worth it to just steal them from you. You'll get 20% of the cut if they turn it in, which might cover most of the material costs, but if they catch you right when you're about to turn it in, then they just save themselves about a half hour of time, making it very appealing for criminals. So there's actually a third faction, and that's pirates. So when you commit crimes in Arcade, you'll leave footprints for stealing crops and trees and bloodstains of varying sizes for attacking or killing other players. Other players can report these bloodstains and footprints with a short description of what they saw, or just lie. And this will increase the player's wanted level. When those points reach 50, which is about five reported murders, they become wanted, and now whenever you're killed by another player, you'll be sent directly to jail to await a trial by a jury of other player characters. The five players in the jury will see every reported bloodstain along with the explanations and be able to have just a short trial. You can plead your case and explain. Other players in the faction will see trial chat and can chime in as well. Ultimately, the jury will choose, and they can choose between a few sentencings based on your crime level and send you to prison. 
which can be anything from a short 15 minute timeout to several hours. I recall seeing honestly someone get 18 hours in prison in the first month of the game. And the counter only goes down while you're in game. You can't use skills while in prison, but there are a few things to do like try to break out, or play soccer, or break boxes. Though you still won't be able to use actions even if you do get out of there until your sentence is up and you can be sent right back. But once you do get out, your crime points will reset, but every crime point you did accumulate will go towards your infamy level. Your infamy level is a separate meter. Once your infamy level reaches 3000, you're branded a pirate. Pirates appear red to both factions, and guards will attack them on sight. You'll be sent to jail any time you're killed on the major two continents, having a permanent wanted status. You'll basically be stuck living on the sea, Auroria, Freeditch, or the only true housing zone for pirates, Browgate Isle, which becomes your de facto home, as your nation leader Morpheus resides here also as a world boss as well, and you have access to just typical faction quests here. Pirates can still involve themselves in plenty of world events, they are a third faction, but they're typically outnumbered and seen as an outside force, which you'd kind of like expect from a emerging kind of faction that isn't default. Many players might have poor opinions of pirates because they typically get there through disrupting other players' gameplay, but it's not a punishment so much as a different play style. And this dynamic is something I adore about Arcage. You can truly be a criminal. In my last year or so of playing the original game, I played as a pirate, and I honestly made some of my best memories outside of the original nostalgia of the first few months. Also, look at these wonderful folks. One almost polarizing opinion I have about Arcage is how much I love the almost asymmetrical nature of gear. You can have two players that are level 55 that are just wildly different in their levels of power. And the special part is how rare it is to have those extremely powerful players because of the scarcity and rarity of these powerful items. I like seeing these crazy powerful players on the battlefield even if they're on the other team. It's just, it creates a sense of realism almost, like this guy is terrifying and I like it. It brings a lot of nostalgia to older games where everyone wasn't equalized for balance and you could see a player with a weapon that actually just made you pee a little. The best gear is rare and you'll almost never see a player in best in slot gear. I'm fairly sure even now no one has that after 10 years which keeps that almost Diablo-like addiction of chasing the next big thing always alive. And since the endgame revolves around PvP more in a create your own adventure kind of style instead of dungeons and raids, this just feels more impactful to have that kind of power floating around. I really love it. Once you hit level 50, you really won't have a whole lot extra open up to you necessarily. You'll get your final skills, which are usually the most powerful, but the game was already mostly available to you in all senses, it's just you might feel it's more approachable at this point, more, feel more comfortable engaging in it now. So one of the first things you might want to do is go through the Greater Howling Abyss dungeon, it's a level 50 dungeon, which will get you a pretty decent set of initial gear to start you off with. The main reason being that it's free as long as you're willing to grind it out, which is a lot better than trying to spend money on an illustrious set or something which really won't value well over time. A lot of the goals from here on are just going to be about upgrading your gear and becoming stronger. Getting more gold is going to be the main goal always, but you'll also need a lot of other currencies, like warrior medals which you get from Mist Marrow and House Hiona can get you a nice necklace that you can upgrade through a almost gambling process, and also a instrument, a pretty powerful one and you'll need honor to get gems for your gear and to give enchantment effects kind of you can do that from doing the crimson rifts and grim gas rifts as well as just natural pvp as you'll get honor for killing enemy factions especially in war and besides that it's really just about making of the game what you want to make out of it you can completely forego pvp even though it's a central focus of the game you can definitely enjoy this game while just doing nothing but sitting in your property and farming and expanding your empire.
make sure that this is not a pay to win game, that there are ways for folks to actually earn the best in slot for everything and not just buy it. So. So where did things go wrong? Well, while we covered much of the game, we wouldn't be talking about Arcage if we were to ignore the cash shop. The alpha period of this game was considered by many of the strongest fans to be the greatest era of Arcage, where while the content scope may not have been as large, the game was free of a cash shop and pay to win mechanics. The game played as advertised. The mechanics all seemed to interlink best at this time and be more driven by players than wallets. The game was smaller, but in a sense fuller. However, players were dreading patch 1.2 because in other versions of the game, like in Korea, this was the patch that introduced the marketplace or cash shop update. And one of the really cool things that came out of this particular trip is that we found a way to do something that both of us have wanted to do for a while. And that is to bring the most recent version of Arcage, the 1.2 version from Korea, to North America. So there is uh, just a couple of impacts to that. Because of the player-driven economy, the cash shop drove a wedge between the free market and disrupted a lot of traditionally strong gold-making methods. Tryon claimed that there was nothing to worry about and Arcage in the West would not be monetized like its Korean counterpart, but then it was. Arcage also had Founders Packs available. $150, $100, and $50, with only the $150 pack providing alpha access. In true Founder Pack fashion, many of these items included were pretty worthless, but they look important to new players, like Evenstones and Hereafter Stones. But regardless, most players either got the $150 pack for the alpha access or the $50 pack for the four-day head start. This was to many what they'd hoped would be the extent of their wallet's involvement in the game. The cash shop offered some skins, cosmetics, house decor, and RNG crates, or loot boxes. These usually contained an especially rare cosmetic within them that some 5% chance but the issue was the other 95%. You typically get a lot of rare materials that were tradable while opening these crates, like Archeum crystals, a key crafting material for almost all gear, which Tryon conveniently also decreased the rates of on the Western version exclusively. If you're seeing the link, you're not being paranoid. They knew very well that the Archeum shortage was an artificially created issue and that the cash shop was gonna be their solution. Archeum scarcity, yes. popular topic on the forums, popular topic I think on our subreddit, on our Twitter, and on our Facebook as well. Yes, pretty much. Again, thank <laughs> pretty much you, all thank around. You. So, thank you all for yeah. the great feedback for the folks who opened up bags and bags and bags and bags, um, and yeah. actually recorded everything that you got yeah. so that we can start seeing, you know, like actual on-server drop rates. Basically, uh, the initial notion was that we would actually have all three Archeum types adjusted mm -hmm. with the introduction of the Arkham supply crate. Yes. Um, as mentioned, and I think as you were They were towards, adjusted, yeah. but yeah. Not, not to the point that the adjustment was visible on the server. Right. Now, if that was it, it'd be one thing, but that's the least offensive part of it. So we are making some tweaks to westernize some of the features of the game. Uh, we're putting things like the labor potion on the store. Uh, we are also tweaking things, you know, like the Guild of Stars. On and you could also buy labor potions. At the launch of Arcage, you'd gain labor while online and offline at a lesser rate if you were a subscriber or a patron. And I've voiced my approval for the labor system, but when you're able to buy more labor, that changes the dynamic heavily. That does make it a mobile-like mechanic, and it breaks the simplistic beauty and equalizing nature of the design. They had a four-hour cooldown so you couldn't just buy dozens, but what many players realized, and are sure Tryon was aware, is that since your labor pool is shared between other characters on the same account, all you had to do was log into another character on the same account and drink another. So you, since you can have four characters on an account, that meant an extra thousand labor an hour. And this is further compounded by character slots being a cash shop purchase. Where you should, said that you didn't really like the four hour cooldown yeah. labor potion. So we are talking with Excel to change that back. Mm -hmm. So we have the 12 hour cooldown labor labor potion, yep. uh, which will help reduce the amount of labor that you can actually get that way. Yes. And with the old pricing as well. Yes. Yeah. But then it goes into the patron system as well. So again, if you were a patron, you'd regenerate labor while offline as well. So the thought for many was to just make more accounts, buy more subscriptions and have a larger pool of labor to work with. 
you could have your alt do the menial tasks while your main did the heavy lifting, or split your land between your other accounts to lower your own tax burden. And this flips a lot of the game's economy design upside down. It was common for most players to have at least one other account, and if you played enough, it wouldn't even come from your own wallet, as you could also buy Apex with gold from other players, and you'd be getting plenty of gold from these methods. Apex is like a WoW token, or an old school RuneScape bond. It can be sold on the auction house or redeemed for credits, which can be used for a subscription or other cash shop items. Two of them will get you a month of subscription time. And in games like WoW and RuneScape, these aren't as harmful to the game as gold doesn't really dictate the endgame goals, but in Arcage it does, because gold is king. Regrade charms were also exclusively sold in the cash shop, or rewarded from RNG boxes, and these increased your chances of a successful regrade, and seeing as the system was so punishing, they put their solution in the cash shop instead of as a crafted material. Now, to some in a game, the response to a player paying to win may seem like, oh, they're just strong, just ignore them and let them wail away, I'll play how I want to still. But in a game this competitive, it breaks the core design and it will affect every other fish in the pond. So if you're extremely well geared and you're in a guild of other extremely well geared players, you can essentially monopolize the entire server, farming the world bosses without any practical opposition, control the market, own all of the castles, and it's happened on my own server. They made an alternate guild to outbid anyone who tried buying their siege scrolls to prevent losing their castles from competition because they had so much money from having so much money. Gold makes gold. And this could happen in time with any guild eventually, of course, but if you paid your way to the top, you got the head start. And when you have the head start, it's very hard to catch up to that as most of the organic methods of getting ahead are cut off by that monopoly and there's most definitely a snowballing effect. The cash shop was rough, but it was far from the only thing that killed the initial run of the game. Exploits were all over. So remember those RNG crates. You'd typically get a few guaranteed items and then one unique, which was in varying worth. But there was an exploit of sorts where you could fill your inventory up to only have enough room for the item you'd wanted from the crate, along with some of the predicted items. And the crate would fail to open every time you clicked it because your inventory was full and it'd re-roll each time you clicked it, so if you kept clicking, eventually it would succeed because there was room in your inventory to place that item, and the other guaranteed items were already in your inventory to stack up. This could be abused for cosmetics, but particularly some of the best regrade charms and other items. And Apex, the most valuable thing you could buy, arguably, as it was a direct exchange of cash to gold, if you ran through the Mirage Isle portal as you used your Apex to receive credits, it would give you the credits, but not consume the item. You could do this indefinitely, meaning infinite credits. Meaning anything on the cash shop that was tradable became available to exploit. And this was deemed by many the most extreme exploit, and it took too long to be acknowledged and fixed before the damage was done. For obtaining land, it's a very competitive situation usually. Players use scripts though to automate placing land designs, even if they weren't nearby, which was a requirement that led to PvP over areas where land was becoming available, like if someone didn't pay their taxes. Meaning in highly contested zones when a house was going down for demolition, everyone would be sitting around the home fighting to be the last person there when it becomes available, but a player could just sit somewhere extremely safe a mile away and automatically grab the land the microsecond it became available. Land can also be sold to other players, so this caused a real estate market held by players using scripts and exploits. There's a few others I've seen, but I don't recall them personally and I can't find solid evidence. But I absolutely wouldn't be surprised if they were real, like being able to spam list an item on the auction house, and since it takes a second to process sometimes when the server's busy, the client would end up getting confused a bit and listing multiple of the same item you put on sale when you only had one, essentially duping them. Or duplicating trade packs by doing odd actions between picking them out of the wagons and putting them back. Now many players were critical of Tryon, while they deflected by saying that their hands were tied and most decisions came from or were blocked by XL Games, which we'd later find out was not really the case. 
A publisher has a sort of hand-in-hand -hand relationship with the developer usually, but in this case, Tryon had a lot more freedom than they initially disclosed. And they used that to monetize the game further and further, and most egregiously, stripping the game of the elements that balanced it to incentivize the cash shop. Like we saw with such an important crafting material, Archeum. Players began to harbor a distrust of Tryon, and Tryon really didn't do much to make things better. And honestly, with a lot of the infrequency of updates and the lack of communication, many players really wondered if Tryon was working on the game at all. Pero cuántos días en total, más o menos? Más o menos. De 45 años has podido trabajar un año. Siete años. Siete. Por ahí ya no más. Pero, Hasta hoy. De 45 años, siete años. Al siete. Pero con descansos. Con... Yo lo primero que entraba en el, a donde me colocaba pedía el día de descanso ya. Y me dice algo yo. Ha entrado usted y ya está pidiendo el día de descanso. ¿Sí? So then, of course, on to launch. Now, remember the four-day head start for founders? Well, most of them didn't get to play much for those four days. There were frequent disconnects, queues, and server downtime which of course only became magnitudes worse on the actual launch day. When the game launched, the queues were outrageous. They didn't have enough servers for the hype train. Players experienced 12-hour queues and beyond, and this was worsened by the fact that patrons got more labor while online, me leading many players to stay logged in when they went to bed or to work. And even with an AFK timer added, this was circumvented through auto hotkey scripts or sitting in the courthouses, which gave a buff that seemed to interfere with the timer. The amount of players was insane, and the game could hardly handle it. On one hand, it was exciting to see so many players flocking to finally play, but on the other was the understandable frustration when you couldn't effectively play. Even when the servers were handling things better, there were several frustrating side effects of the game being so popular. Many players may remember the infamous lines for certain quest givers early on, where only one player could do it at a time with a cooldown. Now, this is fine and typical when there aren't many players, but when everyone's starting at once and there are over 100 players trying to access this one required NPC to progress, this happened for multiple quests while leveling and caused a huge bottleneck for most players. But what players came up with is kind of beautiful. They formed a line and completed it one by one, and if anybody cut in line, they were put on the list by many guilds of the server, and they would be killed on site later on as they entered PvP zones around level 30 and up. It actually worked pretty well, and I think that's pretty incredible. As time went on the first month and queues remained an issue, Tryon kept adding more servers. And this seemed like the correct move, of course, but as more MMOs know nowadays, it's far better to protect the life of the game long term than to make these impulsive moves for the short term. No matter the hype at launch, player counts will drop as many players realize the game just isn't for them or we're just trying it with a friend or maybe just move on to the next game. And there were many restrictions as well to try and counter faction imbalance, which was especially devastating for communities and guilds that had players still joining or trying to get a friend to play and they couldn't play on your own faction. But this settled down for a bit. The game was exciting, and when it worked for the first month, and for many, when looking at things with rose tinted glasses, one of the best experiences. Guild drama was heavy and interesting. The race for any sizable gear upgrade, low-level PvP, where a dungeon weapon that would now be considered worthless just made you a warlord. And just watching the server come alive with homes and players running packs on their donkeys. Even with the monetization, there was the beauty in the game for many. But then one update changed things drastically. While many players were just happy to farm and experience the community, more competitive guilds had their eyes set on something bigger, the game's castles. These were in the northern continent of Aurora. This area was initially intended to unlock with the game's launch, creating a sort of race across the ocean to this high level area to claim castles, a contest of power, preparation, speed, efficiency. But what happened was it came in November through an update. The servers went down for the release. The players were ready to go the moment they logged in, inventory set up with potions, buffs ready to go, entire guilds ready in their voice chat to go through this insanely competitive event. But when the time came up for the servers to come, they didn't. And then the issues just kept piling up. 
For many servers, the lag was so bad that it wasn't even a competition. But if it were just that, then at least your competition is dealing with it as well. The lag was bad and many players were being disconnected regularly, but they'd rush back in until something massive happened. The authentication servers went down. So players who were still online remained in game, but players who disconnected could not log back in. Tryon was fully aware of this issue and kept claiming they were working on it, but they kept the servers online the entire time. To make things even better, the authentication servers were only down in North America. Players outside of this region, like South America, who made up a large population of the game, and my server particularly, were seemingly unaffected. In my home server of Salfira, this resulted in only the South American guilds being able to play effectively during this major game event. They claimed all four of the castles, and that power snowballed over the course of a year, until they were finally taken down by the guild slayers, who arguably made things worse. If you ask many players when they left Dark Age, this is probably the moment they'll mention, or at least it'll be a highlight. There was a lot of planning that went into this event for guilds. Coordination between 100 guild members, supply gathering, taking days off of work, all sorts of things to get their castle. But it wasn't just that they didn't get it, that's just the game. It was the preventable technical issues and the response from Tryon that, even though they were aware of these issues, they had a backup right before the update that they could roll back to. They refused to. They kept things as they were. And this is where you see the game tank in players more than any other time in the game's history. Many players just outright left. My old guild quit from this event, my best friend I played with quit from this, and I stopped playing for a bit as well. And while the game would spike for short bits from big content updates, it would come right back down just as fast as players saw that the cash shop got more love than anything else. And after a little less than a year, a server merge was already announced. In many MMOs, this may not be a big issue, but in Arcage, the world is built on one server already, so what happens to your home? What happens to the castle you claimed? The politics within guilds? Merging servers in Arcage is like scooting Spain into France. It breaks a lot of the culture and personality of a server to merge them. The original community manager, Scapes, was a somewhat beloved icon initially. He was an active and helpful member of the community, particularly during Alpha. But around launch, it seemed the pressure may have stacked too high with all the issues surrounding their implementation of Arcage, and his approval ratings dropped pretty hard. He became a more silent figure, only really showing up to ban players in the forums for voicing their disapproval with Tryon's decisions, or to pop into a live stream to try and save face for the company. A lot of it was just a PR thing. The live streams felt a little desperate, like they were all trying to prove very hard that they cared about the players, but ultimately nothing really changed and a lot of their promises were empty, no matter how genuine they seemed. Scapes stepped down for the most infamous community manager, Celestrada, and she started out pretty strong. I remember this personally early on, like during their introduction post on the forums, but it didn't seem to really last long. There was a lot of inconsistency to their management and even more shutting down of any criticism towards the game. Now, MMO players can certainly be unruly, and I don't envy a community manager's job, but a majority of their complaints were entirely valid issues with the game, and they either got shut down, censored, or the players were banned under some false pretenses. Celestratus started to change in tone pretty quickly, becoming more short with players and impulsive on decisions, and became a pretty significant meme within the community fast. I could still see in many employees at Tryon that there was a sort of crooked passion for the game there, but I never saw any of it translate into actually benefiting the game, and only to what could keep it close enough to the original vision while filling their coffers. The game would see continual updates in the form of new housing designs like specialized armors, apothecary, and trade pack homes, new world events like Abyssal Attack, new dungeons like Miss Song Summit, and even a new world boss like the Leviathan. But these came in frequently in combination with the expected time commitment to the game because of the slow, daily driven gameplay. This was when I started to see my love of the game start to fall as the game's population had begun to drop where all 
competitive players just merged together into one guild and the rest were kind of just peons. The monopoly had started to begin where there wasn't enough population to combat one super guild. And then server transfers began. Server merges were one thing, but transfers were a whole different breed of chaos. I remember a highly competitive guild transferring over to my home server and absolutely rolling through it, trying to fight that one competitive guild left on each server when there was nothing left on their own. And when they were done and felt satisfied, they moved to the next server and so forth. These players were desperate for that initial feeling of the game, but weren't finding it in the stagnating servers Tryon was managing. At around 3.0, the game started experimenting with fresh start servers, giving players a chance to restart the game, experience the initial rush of low-level PvP, gear scarcity all over again, and to become a competitive force again on an equal playing field. But ultimately, you could argue this was a failed attempt as many of the whales would yet again buy their ways to the top right off the bat. You can see every time a fresh start surfer has happened how hopeful the game looks on Steam charts and then how fast it drops back down when players realize what's happening all over again. In 2018, Gamigo acquired Tryon Worlds and with that publishing rights to Arcage. And then in late 2019, Arcage Unchained was announced, a buy to play re-release of Arcage that would feature no pay to win mechanics. It would be bought once and then you'd be on the same playing field as all others. And this was initially highly anticipated, but the hype died fast as the game slowly started to rely on its battle pass variation, arc pass, to monetize once again, locking progression behind it and then into the cash shop. The game really just couldn't help but monetize the players, and it eventually turned into a subscription game instead of a buy to play. What's, ha what's been happening to the Arc Pass or with the Arc Pass? Okay, so we'll, we'll start with a full summary. You know, uh, those of you in chat who are familiar with the Arc Pass, it's basically a system that was added to Arc Age Unchained. And the original conceit for the system, the original goal, was to add a supplemental sort of progression that allowed players to gain items that were gained on legacy servers, normally through the cash shop or the marketplace. It was a way for us to redistribute those items through gameplay um, instead of invasively changing all of the systems in the game. Now, I, I have to be honest, with the way that the Arc Pass currently was on the live service, it's drastically different that, than that initial vision. Uh, I personally feel like we missed the mark with it, and I take responsibility for that. The dailies were never really that enjoyable, and they were frequent in the earlier patches, but as the game progressed, dailies became a more in integral part of the experience, which really drove a lot of players away from this era of the game, and particularly Arc Age Unchained. In 2020, Kakao became the majority shareholder for XL Games and still holds it to this day. August 2023, Arc Age is now merging with Arc Age Unchained. Who knows, combined they might hold like 100 players. But as far as the future goes, Arc Age 2 was announced for a 2024 release date. We'll see if that happens. But from what we've heard recently is that it may not be as PvP centric. Who knows? We don't really know much about this, so it'd all be speculation, but I'm excited for a new iteration of the game. So until then. I've been mostly praising this game. It is one of my favorite MMOs, if not my favorite but nothing's perfect. The core game still has issues which could be defended, but still leave a sour taste in my mouth. A lot of the game's progression is through RNG. In many ways I love this, but when playing with friends it can be a little disheartening, as you can feel left behind if their luck's favorable and yours not. The best way to approach this is to think of your friend group as a single unit probably. It's great that they're becoming more powerful, but if you're used to a more linear progression where you'll advance at the same rate and have the same opportunities at the same time, it's just not as likely. And you or them may have to put in much more work to get to the same spot. But there are many ways you can work together where this isn't an issue. I mean, it's ultimately a group game, so it's not a really big problem, but the RNG is still definitely a factor that may deter some players. The sandbox element of the game feels a little underwhelming. I love the game for what it is, but to call it a sandbox could be stretching it. Many players call this a sand park, as a hybrid between sandbox and theme park. The game gives you many options for how to play, but those options are still ultimately decided by the core design of the game. Player nations were introduced in later patches, which lets you basically create your own faction with players of your choice or your guild, but maybe too far into the game's life. The dailies and time-gated progressions were 
always my least favorite aspect of Arcage, and anyone in my friend group can definitely attest to my distaste of these. For Gilda, unless you want to run overseas packs, you'll mostly do these daily Blue Salt Brotherhood quests. And these are essentially level 5 quests being repeated. You know, raise a mount again, collect these 12 items on the ground near a level 15 dungeon, place vases in a starting area zone at just certain checkpoints. Just very underwhelming busy work dailies that really lack creativity. Many players also just make new characters and run the story quests for that 70 Gilda or so that you get and then just buy cheap designs or convert them into a tradable version of Gilda, Gilda Dust, which is used for some crafting recipes. Because getting Gilda naturally can just be very boring. To progress, you'll need a lot of random currencies, not just Gilda, whether it's honor, warrior medals, or merit badges. Honor can be best obtained from doing daily events like Crimson or Grimgast Rift or the Arena. Those first two are events where in a raid you'll fight increasing waves of enemies at set times of the game's day-night cycle. You can get honor from PvP, but especially in the retail servers, the rates are fairly low and this is just a slow grind unless you're some sort of warlord and always can find those opportunities for PvP. Not to mention many of the items you'll get from honor, like gems for your gear, are RNG based. Warrior medals are kind of the same thing, a little less RNG though. You get them from doing certain PvP events like Mist Marrow and Halcyona, as well as daily quests like giving your faction leader a hundred of a certain material like lumber or stone. Pretty underwhelming, as these two world PvP events, maybe they just haven't aged well, but they just don't feel very balanced or thought out all the time. Mist Marrow could be pretty fun, and it was when it first launched, but players have kind of caught on to how you can almost abuse it. Because it's a King of the Hill style, kind of event, but without gradual score increases for holding the bases and just the base amount of towers that you've captured. So it's a 30 minute event and most players just go in and get the quest and then everyone either AFKs or leaves until the last few minutes and comes back to finish it off. It didn't need to be a 30 minute event because the last few minutes are all that really matters because all it takes is one cycle of fighting for those towers instead of just doing it repeatingly for 30 minutes until that final couple minutes. Merit badges are another currency that isn't intended to be for progression as much, especially initially, but some items were added that just realistically make it the best path, like the Axie Mundi Aegis. It's an extremely rare drop from an extremely rare haunted chest that comes from Aurora mobs that is a necessary material for upgrading your best in slot cape, your guild cape. Merit badges are often obtained by doing dailies given by the game or achievements, but those are one time. And these could be some of the least offensive as you get some gold as well for doing them and they can be pretty simple and end up tying with many things you'd already do, like spending labor or doing world events. But some of them are basically just rerunning these very early game dungeons, like level 15 dungeons, or making a trade pack in a random region in another continent, which usually ends up in players just crafting them and dropping them on the ground. Not really encouraging players to try running packs from different areas of the game like it was probably intended. The balancing could be better for skill sets and their interactions. On my original run of the game, it was basically you run mage or lose, what was called a mage ball in PvP. In the current patch I play on, 3.0, Dark Runners, a fast squishy melee class, are the most overtuned probably. I play a class that shares two skill sets from Dark Runner. Blade Dancer, which got some major improvements by this patch, but I still sometimes feel like I'm shooting myself in the foot by not switching out Songcraft for Aramancy. Such a powerful PvP skill set, but I'd rather play how I want to play and what's fun for me. Though I feel like this isn't very tolerated for the more hardcore events, it's just not meta enough. With 120 classes, it can be disappointing that some two-thirds of them are considered memes. After a bit on any server, while the game will still feel alive and nothing feels necessarily empty, the lack of meaningful endgame content can start to creep in. Most players will just be trying to get gold and upgrade themselves, but the biggest question is going to be what for? Individual power can be fantastic, but it doesn't always mean a lot if there's not always a place to use it. Castle sieges are some of the most exciting events in the game, but they don't happen too often. The complacency of guilds can sometimes start to stagnate the game. And though this is realistic and could be seen as a positive, leaving these cycles of the calm before the storm, it still leaves many periods of staleness in the game's activity. It is a game after all. The labor system, while I've lauded its benefits, can still suck. 
because it makes you feel like if you're not playing the game and utilizing your labor, min-maxing it, you're falling behind. Taking short breaks feels kind of rough as even if you want to take a week off, you'll still feel the need to log in to at least burn off your labor, whether it's on tax certificates or something. And if you want to play the game and your labor is low, and you feel like there's really not much you can do at all besides maybe farm coin purses to open when you do have labor, but you do that and you're back to square one because all you did while you played was click open hundreds of items until your labor's gone again. It's an important system, but perhaps there'd be better ways to implement it. As far as the positives, this is one of my favorite games. I've touched them all plenty, but to summarize, the combat's great and you feel like you can really build your character how you want to in many ways still. The world feels important. You don't just go through a starter zone and then forget about it. There's not really a single hub, though the faction capital still serves as a great gathering point, but the whole world just feels meaningful. The gear system is punishing, but it leaves you always with something to look forward to, instead of just everyone being in the same gear at the end, just waiting for the next update. The PvE aspects of the game, like just being at your home, could be their own entire game, and are done better than most even single player games. The guild interactions keep everyone in the game kind of recognizing each other. I mean, you start to recognize every max level player almost, even on a very populated server, as there are just so many events where you all come together or interact with other guilds of the game for better or for worse. Everyone seems to just make a specific name for themselves, whether you're a crafter, a pirate, or a leader. Just being able to make a name for yourself in this game is, for plenty of folks, a reason they play MMOs over single player games. So onto that classic server that I mentioned. It's a private server that I love to play on. It's created and managed by a team of passionate lovers of the original game. They set the game to go to 3.0 officially with plans for custom content in an almost OSRS fashion as time continues to stem stagnation without going down the road of the original game, which has honestly bloated itself with their worst features. There is no pay to win. Buying gold is highly policed and will get you a ban and you need to link your account to their Discord server to play, which helps in policing and to prevent bots and gold sellers and alternate accounts, which are also very strictly forbidden. I really enjoy this server and I think it's a great time. Much of the footage from this video is captured from it and while the community of any PvP MMO or any MMO can be pretty unruly, I think many players would still welcome new folks in happily. If you do join, hit me up in-game. My name is Rise. If I'm not busy, I can try and help you get started out if you need an extra hand. I'm happy to see new players and see the server grow, so... There are some key differences between the server and the original game, but I'll leave that to the documentation here. I feel all the changes work to benefit the game, even when they seem drastic, and it's worked to combat a lot of the issues the game ended up circling around with the cash shop on retail servers, so it ends up being pretty... functional. Anyways, I hope this video scratched an itch for you on Arcage content. As a huge lover of the game, I've felt a somewhat void in YouTube of content around it. I had laryngitis recently also, so thank you for enduring any voice cracks or anything. And again, if you watched all this, I appreciate it so much. I've recently been kind of rekindling my passion for making YouTube videos. I put a silly amount of effort and time into this video, but I still feel it's pretty rough, so I'd really like to improve going forward. So thank you again.